Good morning. Good morning. I am here today with former Representative John Bruges. That's right. Okay. Who represented the 199th Legislative District from Adams, Cumberland, and York Counties. He served the legislature from 1983 to 1992. And I'm very pleased to have you here with me today. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to start off by asking you about your childhood and your family life and how you feel that they prepared you for public service. I'm from the state of Delaware. And they had no law school in Delaware. So I came to Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And uh, as a student here, I was going to go back to Delaware, but I liked Carlisle. I liked Pennsylvania. I liked the small towns. And uh, so I stayed. And you attended Dickinson Law School? Dickinson Law School, yes. Okay. So um, when, do you remember when you received your degree from Dickinson? Probably about 1958, maybe? 58, 59. Yeah. Okay. And um, were you, what happened after you received your degree? Were you involved in any other um, line of work or were you always well, then an attorney? I, when I got my degree, I decided I wanted to practice law. I didn't want to go with a big firm. I just wanted to hang out a shingle. And that's a rare thing, so I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of work to do in a small town, but I had clients from the beginning because I participated in a lot of activities within the township and the borough. And it's just a matter of becoming involved with the community. And as a result, uh, I had a lot of clientele. It wasn't anything special or that I was any very good as an attorney, but it was a matter of just being with people. Did that translate then into your interest in politics? <clears throat> My interest in politics started in the Depression. It didn't affect me because I ran and played and was never without want because my father was initially a Greek from, it, from Greece and I was able to have a father who loved America and his love for America. I guess you could say it uh, rubbed off on me because he wanted to fight in World War I and when it came time to walk down Broadway, the Broad, Broad Street in Philadelphia where the my father had lived. And the, and the war ended. And he was sorry that he couldn't help his country. Hmm. So we had uh, a good relationship, which meant that dad got up at five in the morning, left at six, came home, dead tired, and I hardly ever saw him. But I loved him. And it was a deep respect. So your love of, your father's love of the country, I think that translate into you serving in the military. Yeah. Um, he wanted to serve. Mm -hmm. And when the Korean War came, 
I enlisted in the Marine Corps. And we had two bro three brothers all together. And one of them and I went to the Korean War. And my brother couldn't go because he had a medical problem. But I was very happy to represent my party and my friends mm -hmm. and my family. And that was with the Marine Corps? The Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. I think um, you had another career later on with the um, Naval. Were you in, in the Navy? Well, the Naval to the extent that I liked sailing. I'm a sailor on the Chesapeake Bay and I thought that I would get in the Navy and be able to sail. And it wasn't that way. <laughs> I was just a reservist. Okay. And then when the war, Korean War came, they, uh, they were going to put me in the naval position. But my brother was smarter than I was. He says, let's go to the Marine Corps. Nobody's calling us up. The Navy didn't know how to call people up. Nobody went because they didn't know how to mobilize. The Marine Corps didn't know how to mobilize because they immediately mobilized 92% of the people that were left from World War II. And I said, that's the outfit for me. Mm -hmm. What was did did you um, when did you retire from um, your career with the Marines? You were in, in the reserves for quite a while, weren't you? In the reserves, I was in the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and I uh, went as far as I could, and I retired as a colonel from a boot Marine. That's a very impressive career, too. And thank you for your service. Thank you. So coming back to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, um, could you talk about your um, political experience and, and what made you decide to run for the Pennsylvania legislature? My political experience was in my parents, who were Democrats, like everybody was during World War II. And my mother was very intelligent. She had no education. But she read all of Shakespeare. She had all of the principal books, stories. And she inspired me to go with the books. So um, were you, you said your, your parents were Democrats, so that was how you became a Democrat then? Well, they were Democrats because everybody was a Democrat. Okay. And then they became Republicans later. Did they? because dad was a businessman and I remained a Democrat and uh, I felt very strongly about Roosevelt and particularly Eleanor Roosevelt. She was a special lady in my life. So was it hard to remain a Democrat in Cumberland County? No, because I knew who I was. I knew what I was going to do. I ran for the district attorney, and I was on the low man on the totem pole, and I didn't give a damn. Mm -hmm. I went out into the hinterland, and I went to places, churches, and things, and uh, I knew the Republicans were all over the place, the judge and everybody else. And I respected them. I went ahead 
and remain very strong. And then I met a Democrat who, Bill Fustenberger, who was the finest gentleman I ever met in politics. He was honest. One time we had a question as to whether or not we would bring some information and give it to the public against the opponent. And the first person they asked was me, and I said, well, I don't think we ought to say this about that person, but I don't mind criticizing him for what he did. And Bill Fustenberger said, no, we're not going. We're not going to lose, use either one of them. He was as honest and fair. He taught me a lot, and we worked very hard, very hard. And through Bill Fustenberger, we were able to put a Democratic, Mr. Myers, who was a Democrat, father was a banker, we were able to put him in, through Bill Fustenberger, to put him into office, first time, long time, when I ran, I ran because I knew politics by losing a long time and not caring that I lost because we did what was right. And when we did that, we had people come out from all over the district in three counties. I was fortunate to have three counties. You mentioned the three mm -hmm. that uh, I came from. And I loved going to York. I loved going to the uh, Adams County. And of course, at home. They thought that they were going to put a man in the office that was a Republican because he purposely put into the office the districts, three of them. But I took them away simply because I worked with the people and I didn't care about the political affiliation of the people that supported me. Now, the the district that we were talking about was a new district, wasn't it? Wasn't it? It was a new district, the 199. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you an interesting story about we were able to make the 199th meaningful in the campaign process. And every time we talked, we talked about the 199th, the cards and the signs were 199th. There's a candidate today that's trying to get in to the government, the political process, and all it is was a lot of mass of talk. All we said was 199th. And I walked down the street in Carlisle and a young black boy, a lovely young child. He looked at me and he was about nine years old and he know, saw my 199th. He says, hey, you the 199th. <laughs> we had identification and we were very close to the black community and we were the entire time and we still are. Mm -hmm. So that we had a lot of people working did you like to campaign? I loved campaigning. The first time I ran, I said I was a top, well, I was a district attorney. And I just worked. I knew the people. I knew the Democrats. I knew the Republicans. And then my wife, she was of Arabic descent. And there were probably only two Arabs in Carlisle but it didn't matter then 
because everybody loved her. She went to people. She loved people. She just goes to everybody's house to help them to do things for them. Mm. So there was a lot of just good company. Can you talk a little bit about um, your subsequent campaigns? And um, was it hard to maintain your district, your seat in the legislature? Did you have tough fights in the elections? After the first, yeah. I had five terms. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there were, at the time, in the area, five legislators, two, at least two, from York, one from Carlisle, that were Democrats. But over the 10-year period, I had a, an unusual method of campaigning. It was, it was unusual. But over 10 period, I went from 500 people the first time to 750 to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. I went all the way up to a high percentage. All the other Democrats went down because they didn't know how to campaign. I'm not blaming, I'm not saying, I'm just saying what the statistics say. And it's a lesson for people now to understand. Don't worry too much about what's good and what's bad and what's political, what's democratic, what's republican. Do the right thing. And tell the people and know the people. So what can you tell me about your district and the people that you represented? <clears throat> well, it's an intelligent community because it's a colonial community. It's a community that is a county seat. It's a community that had major issues in the uh, politics, in history, particularly historical, because we had people that were involved in the, the, declaration, the declaration in the Constitution, and uh, we had people that were academics with Dickinson College, just an extraordinary institution and is getting more extraordinary under the President Durden in Dickinson College now. So we had a lot of things going for us. My wife was a teacher. I was an attorney. We were involved in the community. And we looked to what was the right and not the, what was political. I had one case in which in Adams County, a Republican came up to me and said, now, the governor has done this. And he's hurting the Republicans and the farmers. And he said, but I better not be talking to you because you're a Democrat. I said, you're asking me to do it, and I'll do it. And then two years later, we had a law on the books for different types, for one type particularly, of commodity marketing. 
and I got it done within two years before the Republicans even knew that I was doing it. And the Republicans and the governor were trying to give the power over commodity marketing to the governor, a Republican. And we took it away from them in two years to give it back to the farmers. And the Republicans in the Adams County area and Cumberland to an extent, but mostly in Adams, decided to give me a fating, a recognition, but it wasn't strong enough for all of the Republicans, so there were about three people there. <laughs> but I didn't care because I did the right thing, and I told him so, and it's there in the books right now. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about your, your first swearing in. Do you recall how you felt whenever you first came to Harrisburg and, and took the oath of office? No. No? I just came. I had a job to do. Okay. I had great guys, uh, the, the caliber of them, legislators that were there at the time, and Mandarino, extraordinary guy. I had a, a problem with him at the beginning. He tried to put me on a problem and say, why did you say, why did you vote on that bill? And I said, because it's not necessary to do it the other way. And he came and apologized because he knew that I was doing what I was doing out of my heart and soul. And that, that guided me for a long time. And then I had a great wife, mm -hmm. very special. Mm -hmm. So um, did you make friends then whenever you were here in Harrisburg? The camaraderie, would you say, was um, strong? Oh, it was good. Yeah, I'll tell you why it was good. Because when I would have a bill, I worked very hard to get support in the bill itself before it had a vote from both parties. And in several bills, I had almost as many Democrats and Republicans at the same time. There was one office, one bill, I have to think of it. Well, I can't think of it, I'll think of it later. But what I did, I worked real hard and I had in one bill, only nine Republicans were against the bill. And after having nine against it, you'd think that I'd probably get it. Well, that was in the House. But the Republican side just didn't want it. And as a result, they stopped it and held it up. And we lost it because we didn't have any control of the Senate. But the Republicans were with us. Yeah. Other, up to nine, only that did not support us. So if it's a good bill, it doesn't matter? Well, it doesn't matter if, the, if one party <clears throat> one party opposes the bill. And that's a sad thing. That's a really sad thing because it was, uh, and I'll think of it shortly and I'll tell you before you were through. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about your, whenever you were a representative, you still maintained your law practice in Carlisle? I did and I <clears throat> know that's always a concern and 
people would say, well, you're, you're doing work on the outside. How can you do both? And I simply said, the first thing I do is take care of my constituents and the issues. Beyond that, I'll work hard as an attorney because I won't do it this long and I don't want to do it this long because I don't want to be there more than five years, six years, seven years. I had no idea I would go to 10 years and I finally did and I think that's good. The Patriot News gave me a, a, a recognition for not staying in the house. And it was written by uh, one of the greatest gentlemen. He complimented me for withdrawing so that others could follow. So you impose a term of limits on yourself. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I don't believe in limitation. I want the people to decide. They've got to have enough intelligence. But part of the job that people have is to, there's a limitation. But at the same time, some people should remain. Like Mandarino, my gosh, what a brilliant man. Mm -hmm. And he took care of people. And as a result, we had good government. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about your committees that you served on? The first committee I, I asked for was agriculture. <clears throat> and people legislators, other legislators, smart legislators, intelligent legislators said, why do you want to support the farmers? There aren't enough votes there. I said, they're the strongest, largest organization for assets and government and the, well, I can't think of the name to call it, but it was the gross national product is greater for farming than other ways. And so that didn't bother me at all. And it was it made me feel so good because uh, the farmers are the salt of the earth. And then the other committees you were appointed to? The other one, military. Military and veterans. Military and because of my uh, association with the Marine Corps and I was uh, uh, involved for a long time. Two wars six and a half years, reserves, and I continue to take active account of the services, all of them. And the other one that you served on was the Local Government Committee. Local Government Committee, because it's so important, I've always supported a strong local government townships, boroughs, we should keep that, but it should be modified. We have today in Carlisle big, massive buildings, trucking, that are just killing the water, the, the, the land, and the use of land and the beauty of land. But that should be turned over to the counties 
to control the land that's there and it's being wasted because now the trucks aren't there as they used to be. And there's a lot of things that should be done, but the small, small government is good because it brings out in people the opportunity to see the supervisors. I was a solicitor for about three supervisors, about three count, three uh, organizations, three uh, organizations. But the important thing is that we should have small units of government at the bottom of the pile in order to give an opportunity to people not to wait and have people that are old, long, doing something else controlling everything. What do you think the hardest issue you faced as a representative was? Well, I'm used to hitting hard things, so uh, it didn't bother me. I would state it, and if I lost it, there's nothing I can do about it. But I just Well, I'm a strong Democrat, and I believe in all of the principles, and I study assiduously Thomas Paine and all of the great people during the Revolution. Would you like to discuss some of your more important pieces of legislation? I, I will open it up to you first, if you'd like to talk about um, which pieces of legislation you're the most proud of? <clears throat> well, there are several. One didn't pass it, <clears throat> but I had a good friend and a brilliant man, John Marr, who was the dean of the Dickinson School of Law. And he says, in his Boston way, he says, Brutus, you know, Pennsylvania doesn't have a program for John Marr came to me and said, Pennsylvania does not have a monopoly law that helps the people to have in the state level what the nation has as a national level. And he told me that so it took me two years to get a bill in because the Republicans opposed it. The Republicans opposed it because the Republicans are concerned with big business and big companies. And as a result, they don't want an antitrust bill. So I lost it. But I carried again, I carried again a high degree of Republicans that were shunted by themselves because the Republicans in the Senate cut it out, did not pass the bill, did not give the bill opportunity to to be considered. 
Then I mentioned the bill, commodity marketing bill, mm -hmm. and that worked. It worked good. And there's other bills that I passed. Do you have a list of them? I have, I have some that you are active in pro protecting Pennsylvania's farming communities. Lots of legislation um, where you worked with um, Representative Morris on the Agricultural Security Act and um, with Representative Bowers legislation and the Grape Growers Bill. We have a whole lots of, lots of uh, legislation that you were involved in. Well, the in. things were there to be done and I was able to get them through because I worked hard. I went to Republicans to join me and they did it. And it's the leadership that fails to permit the people within their bailiwick to put good legislation out. And you talked about the um, commodities um, legislation. And would that require um, farmers to receive prompt payments? Is that, was that well, the provision it, it of it? Was, it's an interesting arrangement. All the people of the apple orchards are asked voluntarily to provide so many pounds or units to put into a fund that provides an opportunity to have administrative and other dollars put in to the good use for for uh, good use for uh, well just the good use of our agriculture. Mm -hmm. I have listed that you had 12 pieces of legislation that were enacted, which is quite an accomplishment in, a, in itself. Um, is there any one that you think you might be particularly fond of? Well, I like the commodity marketing. Okay. And uh, there were a number of small bills, and I say small, there's not too much talk about it, but there's a lot of things that can get done if you persevere and if you constantly, and if you get the people that are in the legislature to understand that you can't reject this you got to support it, and they would do it. Mm -hmm. And there's Republicans that will tell you that what happened. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to brag on your behalf, okay? <laughs> um, in 1983 and 84, you had three acts passed, and um, the one was Volunteer Firemen's Relief Associ Association Act which approved um, providing for the coverage to paid firemen when acting as volunteer firemen during off-duty hours. Um, the next one was the Surface Mining and Conservation Reclamation Act, which exempted municipalities from the bond requirement relating to the operation of gravel pits, providing for self-insurance and changing the effective date <coughs> of application of certain provisions to non-coal mining activities. Well. <coughs> There was an amazing event that occurred. <clears throat> and to tell you the importance of having Republicans and Democrats insist on an issue, a Republican was asked to help somebody do some work. And he says, go see John Bruges. He'll work on it for you. And there were 
two persons who were legislators in this general area. They wouldn't do it because it was against the Republican condition. And they came to me and said, can you help us? And I said, well, I'll put a bill in. And when I put the bill in, the Republicans didn't pick it up. And they passed the bill under their nose because I persisted and it took two terms to get out. Hmm. Now, I'm saying that as a matter of fact because it happened. And it's, it's something that means a lot to me because they were saying, here's something that's good, but we can't do it because we're in a political problem. And the details of that are amazing. Um, from 1983 and 1984, you also had an act amending the public school code um, that would require public hearings prior to school closings, further providing for alternative payment plan for illness or accidental injury and authorizing the state treasurer to recover Social Security overpayments on behalf of school employees. In 1985 and 86, um, you talked about this, an act providing for the provisions of poultry and egg contracts and imposing civ civil penalties. Also in 85 and 86, an act amending um, known as the Non-Coal Surface Mining Conservation and Reclamation Act. So that was the, you said it was passed here and then you did it again the next session, which authorized additional exemptions from the definition of surface mining. And in 1987 and 88, you had an act amending um, the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Agricultural Commodities Marketing Act of 1968, changing the name of the advisory boards to commodity marketing boards and further providing for powers and duties of said boards and further providing for the powers and duties of the Secretary of Agriculture. And also in 1987 and 88, you had an act which was known as the Electric Cooperative Corporation Act to further provide for director's liability and indemnification. And that was because of a special group of people that wanted that work. And it was an organization, democratic organization, that achieved that. You also had an act designating Latorte Spring Run as a component of the Pennsylvania Scenic Rivers System in accordance with the Pennsylvania Scenic Rivers Act, providing for cooperation and coordination in its protection and use of responsibilities in its management. And then in 1989 and 1990, you had an act known as the Borough Code which was um, to further provide for the sale of borough real property. And you had um, the Solid Waste Management Act, which further provided for certain limits and permits, providing that no bond shall be required as a condition of issuance for a permit or license to a municipality or a municipal authority. Yeah, why should there be? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so some just made sense, huh? <laughs> 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 a lot of it makes sense. <laughs> and then in 1991 and 92, uh, which was your last term, you had um, an act providing for the payments by the Commonwealth to municipalities which have expended money to acquire and construct sewage treatment plants in accordance with the Clean Streams program. Um, and then you also had uh, the last one was an act conferring limited residency status on military personnel and their dependents assigned to an active duty station in Pennsylvania, further providing for rates of tuition for certain military personnel and their dependents. Yeah, that, there's a lot of small, I say small because it's not 
too important to a lot of people, but it is to the servicemen. And, and probably to the people that it really impacts. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I had, I had a ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think um, if anyone came to you with an issue, it sounds like you were very responsive to the needs of what needed to be done. <clears throat> well, one time down in Adams County, and I went out to the farmers all the time, <clears throat> and I met this one guy. I don't know whether I told you this one. This guy said, in, he says, I think <clears throat> the guy said, I don't know whether I ought to talk to you about this. You're a Democrat. He says, but uh, I says, no, don't worry about it. I'll do it if it's right. And uh, this is a Republican. If he couldn't get anywhere close to Governor Thornburg, strike. <clears throat> um, and he said, you know, my brother is the proponentary of Adams County. And I said, that's fine. <laughs> <coughs> But these people were kind of, to an extent, joyous in having me talk to them and not being afraid that I got to go up to see the boss. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, I enjoyed it. People, when I, when I left, people said, well, I guess I, you're, you're, you're glad you get, I says, hell no, I was having fun. <laughs> well, you talked about it being a, a fun you know, 10 years. What would you say maybe your fondest memories were of serving in the, in the house? The fondest memories were working with guys like uh, names of people was Anyway, <clears throat> working with good guys that wanted to work, and I had a lot of them that did, and they were thankful that I was doing these things because it was happening, and it happened. Men like Tom McClovick are little gods. They just smile at you say, yeah, let's do it, and he goes on about his business. Okay. Well, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to come in and talk to me today. I appreciate it so much, and um, I hope you had an enjoyable experience. Oh, I did. I enjoyed it.